Good afternoon. A few things at the top, and then I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, this morning at the U.S. ASEAN Summit, President Biden announced the U.S. intent to provide up to $102 million in new initiatives to expand the U.S. ASEAN Strategic Partnership. As President Biden said, the relationship between the United States and ASEAN is vital for the future of all one billion of our people. The U.S. ASEAN Futures initiatives, uh, initiatives reflect this administration's deep commitment to ASEAN's central role in preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific. This new funding includes the intent to provide up to $40 million in new efforts to fight the COVID-19 pandemic as part of the U.S. ASEAN Health Futures in Initiative, up to $20.5 million for a new U.S. ASEAN Climate Futures Initiative, up to $20 million to promote economic growth and opportunity through a new U.S. ASEAN Economic Futures Initiative, and up to $21.5 million to support the Billion Futures Initiatives, including programs that promote education, English language learning, and gender equality and equity. In addition, President Biden expressed his commitment to expanding our formal engagement and cooperation uh, with ASEAN via ministerial level meetings on health, energy, the environment and climate, transportation, gender equality, and women's empowerment. Next, today on Intersex Awareness Day, we recognize the voices and contributions of intersex communities in the United States and around the world. Too often, intersex persons are subjected to violence, to discrimination, and abuse solely on the basis of their sex characteristics. We recognize these obstacles and are clear in our commitment to support intersex people. We further recognize the hard work of intersex activists, intersex human rights organizations, and allies who work to promote and to protect the human rights of intersex persons globally. As President Biden and Secretary Blinken have made clear, it is the policy of the United States to pursue an end to violence and discrimination on the basis of gender, of sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, or sex characteristics. The Department of State is committed to promoting the freedom, the dignity, and equality of all persons including, of course, intersex persons, and we will continue to do that. And then finally, I want to share some news that uh, is very exciting for one member of our team, uh, but uh, perhaps, uh, well, I'm confident it is uh, much more bittersweet for uh, the rest of us. Uh, this week will mark the last week in the office for Gladys Bobs. Uh, many of you know Gladys. She is a senior uh, employee in our press office. Uh, she is retiring after 44 years of government service, 44. Having joined the State Department in uh, press office in 1986, uh, Gladys is truly a walking embodiment of this institution. She is widely recognized for her deep experience and expertise, as well as her strong sense of professionalism and collegiality. And during her 35 years of press work, serving eight presidential administrations, 12 secretaries of state, and 17 State Department spokespeople, and I uh, am lucky, consider myself lucky to be included in that last category, Gladys had, has made her incredible contributions uh, to this institution. Across well over 2,000 press engagements during her career, Gladys has played an integral part in promoting U.S. foreign policy around the world and explaining these goals and why they matter to the American people. Her achievements are a testament uh, to the value of our public servants, and we are grateful for Gladys and for her service. Gladys' experience is truly irreplaceable, and while we will, of course, miss her, uh, we also send her our best wishes uh, for what is an indisputably well-earned uh, retirement. Thank you very much, Gladys. Matt. We are here. Uh, let me just say a couple of things. For, for those of us who have covered this building for a long time, you know, Gladys has really been an indispensable and uh, also omnipresent um, uh, figure, personality who's been around. And anyone who has gone up to uh, the seventh floor, the, the eighth floor, the Ben Franklin Room, or at the UN in the days when we were still at the Waldorf, spent hours of time in the service elevators with Gladys waiting to go up to various photo ops uh, knows uh, how <clears throat> important uh, a role she played. And so um, congratulations to her. Thank you for your kind words for her. And I'm 
I'm sure that the, Sean and the association will have something uh, more to say about her and her retirement. But mm -hmm. I mean, it, she really was, uh, is, is still is an institution. Yes, you know, always and, will be, and 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 has dealt with uh, a variety of characters uh, over the years, including myself, but also my <laughs> predecessors. Uh, anyway. Uh, so th thanks again for your remarks about her. Um, I wanted to uh, start with Sudan because <clears throat> I understand, maybe other people understand it too as well, that um, Special Envoy Feltman had, a call, Feltman had a call with the Egyptian foreign minister uh, either late yesterday or today. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us what that was about. Did it involve uh, any kind of questions that the U.S. might have about um, General Burhan's planned or maybe uh, planned visit to, to, to Cairo. What do you understand, if anything, about Egypt's role in what happened uh, in Khartoum? Well, uh, let me start by saying, Matt, that we have been entirely unequivocal uh, in our condemnation uh, of the events over the past 36 or so hours. Uh, we made very clear yesterday that the anti-democratic uh, anti actions of the Sudanese military, uh, it subverted the constitutional declaration of 2019, uh, but in some ways more importantly, it has subverted the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people. And the Sudanese people have reaffirmed those democratic aspirations uh, even in recent hours, uh, we saw the Sudanese people peacefully take to the streets uh, to make clear uh, their, the fact that they uh, seek a restoration of civilian-led democratic uh, leadership. Uh, but it has not only been the United States that has been unequivocal uh, in our condemnation of these events. We've joined nations and organizations from across the world uh, in expressing concern. Uh, that includes the African Union, it includes the UN, uh, the, UN uh, the Organization of Islamic Coordination, uh, France, Germany, Canada, and the UK, Sudan's neighbors as well, to get to your question, Egypt, Ethiopia, and South Sudan have also called for de-escalation and dialogue. Uh, since the events of uh, late Sunday night, our time, uh, Monday in Khartoum, Secretary Blinken, uh, the Special Envoy, uh, Jeffrey Feltman, our Assistant Secretary uh, for our African Affairs Bureau's Mali, M Bureau, Molly Fee, uh, and many others in this building uh, and across uh, this administration, uh, they have been working the phones nonstop. Uh, they have been in touch uh, with counterparts uh, from the region, uh, including Sudan's neighbors, uh, and you alluded to this, Matt. Uh, we have been in touch with uh, governments uh, in the broader Middle East. Uh, we have been in touch uh, with our allies and partners uh, all over the world, uh, including Europe uh, and elsewhere. Uh, so the Secretary has had uh, calls, uh, the Special Envoy uh, has had a number of calls, uh, Molly Fee has had a number of calls as well. When it comes to the Secretary, um, we'll be in a position to uh, uh, read out uh, some of those engagements, but uh, this has been a priority for the leadership in this building. Uh, to see to it that uh, we work with the international community uh, to affect what it is that we are trying to see. Uh, an immediate release of all political actors detained in connection with these events, a full restoration of the civilian-led transitional government, uh, and a refraining from any violence against peaceful protesters, including the use of live ammunition. And we strongly condemn uh, recent reports uh, of violence against peaceful protesters. Our goal at this stage, Matt, in terms of all of these conversations, uh, is to establish uh, a common position uh, with our allies and partners. And I think you've seen uh, at least the, the uh, initial iteration uh, of a common position emerge. Uh, including from many of the countries and organizations that I just ran through. There has been a strong condemnation uh, of the military takeover. Uh, there has been uh, a call, um, a broad, unified call uh, for a restoration of the civilian-led transitional government. 
Uh, there has been a call by many countries and international organizations uh, for those detained, uh, including uh, Prime Minister Hamdak, uh, Minister of Religious Affairs Mafari, uh, and others uh, from the civilian uh, government who have been detained for them to be released. And of course, a strong universal call uh, for the military to refrain from violence uh, against peaceful protesters, uh, seeking nothing more than the restoration uh, of their democratic aspirations. My question was about Feltman, Special Envoy Feltman's call with the Egyptian Foreign Minister Shukri. Do you have anything specific to say about that call? The or, or anything specific to say about what role Egypt might have played in encouraging or discouraging uh, uh, General Burhan's action? Uh, look, we're not going to be in a position to read out uh, every call, but um, as I've said before, uh, we have engaged uh, with a number of our partners, including Sudan's neighbors, uh, to establish a common position uh, and to make sure that uh, the Sudanese military hears our collective voice okay. uh, very well, clearly. Do you have a common uh, position with Egypt right now? Well, so Egypt, and, and I will just uh, note here what Egypt has said publicly, I will lead, leave it to uh, our partners in Cairo to, um, uh, to speak for their position. But what they've uh, said publicly is uh, they're working to ensure stability, security. Um, uh, they are closely following uh, these uh, events. Uh, they are looking at the safety of the Sudanese people. Uh, so we are working closely well, with uh, our Egyptian partners, well, that, just as we are with, uh, with well, other Well, that's neighbors. fine, but that is a far cry from your absolute condemnation, demand for the immediate release of all political actors, uh, an end to, uh, you know, repression, suppression of, of protests. So uh, can you say at this point, honestly, can you say if the Egyptians are on board with your... With your, with, with your position? Matt, I, I'm not going to speak for other countries. Uh, I will just speak for the United States. Last uh, and uh, we are speaking uh, with partners, uh, with allies around the world, uh, including Sudan's neighbors, uh, okay. to establish a common position and to do all we can uh, to see to it that democracy is restored in Sudan. Last one. In terms of consequences um, beyond the, uh, since yesterday when you announced the suspension or the pause in the $700 million, uh, in ESF, has there been any um, movement on suspending or not suspending? I saw the USAID statement that their humanitarian assistance will continue, but of course that wouldn't be affected by, uh, our humanitarian aid is not affected by the, any kind of restrictions. So has there been any movement uh, or developments in terms of assistance? Well, so I want to be uh, very clear on, on that point, and we've had an occasion to speak to this in other contexts recently. Uh, but we always differentiate uh, between bilateral assistance uh, and humanitarian assistance, the latter category uh, going to support the people, uh, in this case, uh, the Sudanese people. And state uh, and USAID, we maintain a significant uh, humanitarian portfolio uh, and a growing uh, development portfolio when it comes to Sudan uh, in this past fiscal year, the fiscal year that ended uh, at the end of last month. Uh, the United States provided $60 million in bilateral health and development, development assistance to Sudan, uh, focused on supporting democracy, supporting human rights and governance, food security, civic engagement, conflict mitigation, and global health assistance. Uh, in addition, we provided more than $400 million, $438 million uh, to be precise, in life-saving humanitarian assistance uh, to Sudan in the last fiscal year. Uh, the $60 million of bilateral health and development assistance and, and all life-saving humanitarian assistance, that is not subject to the current assistance pause. Uh, the assistance pause at the moment, um, as we evaluate the next steps for Sudan programming, uh, implicates uh, the $700 million in emergency economic support funds or ESF funds uh, that we spoke to uh, yesterday. Um, all of this assistance, uh, and we spoke to this at some length yesterday, uh, is of course provided consistent with the applicable restrictions, including those restrictions that have been in place on Sudan uh, since um, uh, the uh, military coup, uh, which was applied to Sudan in 1989 when the former Bashir regime uh, rose to power. Could I ask sure. a follow up on that? Um, uh, Prime Minister Hamdok, has the United States, have any, has, has the United States had any contact with him uh, since the we are pressing uh, for the prime minister's release. We are pressing for the release of other uh, civilian leaders uh, who have been detained uh, since the start uh, of the military's 
uh, takeover. Uh, communications, I should say, in Sudan have been difficult, especially in Khartoum. There have been internet blackouts. There have been uh, restrictions uh, when it comes to uh, phone usage. So communications, has, uh, communications have been difficult. Um, we don't have any um, uh, discussions with Prime Minister Hamdok or, or other members of civilian uh, government uh, to read out, um, but we are continuing to press uh, every uh, appropriate lever uh, for their release. Do you, um, the, um, General Burhan was saying that he's been well treated, that he's at his home. Uh, do you have any, any, um, any indication of whether the Prime Minister has been treated well? Uh, I will say what I said yesterday, and that is now that the Prime Minister, now that other members of the civilian-led transitional government remain in military custody, it is the military's responsibility to ensure that they are treated well, uh, to ensure their safety, to ensure their security, to ensure uh, their health. Uh, I don't have any updates to provide, but we are watching very closely uh, to uh, see to it uh, that the military does just that. Just, just one. Well, just, we'll finish out with Sean and we'll just, we'll just, just one. Sorry, just one briefly. Um, uh, the rule of Omar Bel Shir, um, the uh, the idea of, of handing him over for uh, on the, the the charges that he's been uh, been accused of. Uh, is the United States uh, hopeful that he'll still be handed over, or is that something that's come to doubt because of this? Uh, look, we're in the very early uh, hours of this. It's just been uh, over a day. So uh, these are questions uh, that will have to be decided in the coming days. Certainly, um, we look to, uh, and we have supported, um, holding uh, members of the former regime, including uh, Omar al-Bashir, uh, accountable um, for uh, past wrongs. So, yeah. I, I just want to point. His whereabouts? Do we know where Can Omar al-Bashir is? Hamdok. Uh, uh, Hamdok's where, whereabouts. Yeah. Where uh, look, it, it is... Um, well, whether uh, he really is in good health and what and all it is, it is not for us to speak to these questions publicly. It is for us to underscore the point that the military has a responsibility now that he remains in their custody, uh, now that the Minister of Religious Affairs, Mufare, and others remain in their custody. The military has a responsibility to ensure they are treated well, uh, to ensure they remain in good health, uh, and to ensure their security. Yes? Um, the UN Secretary General of the Affairs was, um, in response to the situation in Sudan, uh, talked about an epidemic of coup d'etats, you know, talking about this, this broader situation. Obviously, this is happening as in the time that you guys, since the Biden administration took power with a, you know, a focus on democracy and human rights. Um, so. I wonder if you wanted to kind of respond to his appeal to big powers, you know, including the United States, um, for unity at the Security Council to have more effective deterrence. And do you agree that there is a lack of deterrence that seems to be leading to countries, or, you know, militaries like Sudan, Myanmar, other countries as well, uh, to take these kind of actions? Well, I, I am not aware, and in fact, I am very confident that the Secretary General I uh, uh, was making any sort of causal link between this administration and uh, some of the anti-democratic actions that we've seen. I think uh, the, uh, sec the, the Secretary General, I think the international community, uh, our allies and partners in the international community uh, would recognize that uh, the United States and the United States under this administration, uh, we have been a forceful and powerful advocate uh, for democracy, uh, for human rights, for universal rights. Uh, we have um, made clear where we stand uh, and with whom we stand uh, in many different fora, including uh, at the UN. Uh, as you know, we will be pulling together an unprecedented uh, event in the coming weeks, the Summit for Democracy, uh, where we'll have a chance with, uh, together uh, with many of the world's, um, many of our democratic partners from around the world uh, to uh, share experiences, to um, uh, learn from one another, uh, and to, to do what we can uh, to beat back uh, the tide of uh, authoritarianism, of uh, repression, uh, wherever it exists. Uh, you, were, you were right that we have seen setbacks uh, in uh, countries, uh, in certain countries. Uh, Sudan is, is the latest of that. Uh, but when it comes to Sudan, uh, when it comes to Burma, uh, when it comes to other countries where we have seen worrying trends, uh, no country has done more. No country has said more. No country has afforded more to the people in terms of humanitarian assistance and humanitarian aid uh, 
uh, than the uh, United States. And so whether it's Sudan, whether it's Burma, uh, whether it is uh, countries where um, anti-democratic uh, forces uh, may be gaining more influence, uh, we will continue uh, to lead that charge. Uh, we will continue to work to galvanize uh, our allies and our partners around the world uh, to make very clear uh, where the United States uh, and where uh, those with whom we share interests and values, and that is a large part of the world, where we stand. Yes? Uh, so in terms of um, holding accountable those responsible for uh, what we've seen, what we may yet see, look, we have been very clear uh, that the United States uh, and our allies and partners uh, will use every appropriate tool to see to it that we can help Sudan uh, reemerge on uh, the path to democracy, uh, to put it uh, put a finer point on it, uh, we will do everything we can to support the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people uh, and to see to it uh, that we can do everything uh, to help them uh, achieve uh, and to realize uh, those aspirations uh, which have been uh, set back, of course, uh, by what we have seen the military do uh, over the course of uh, the past 36 uh, or so uh, hours. When it comes to what we call this, this is very clearly a military takeover. Um, yesterday we spoke about um, uh, the historical um, uh, context here. Um, what is true is that we are closely monitoring uh, the events in Sudan. Uh, we know that the military has hijacked the, trans the democratic transition. Uh, these actions to seize power are unacceptable. They are a contravention of Sudan's constitutional declaration. Uh, which, along with the Juba Peace Agreement, is the agreed framework uh, for the democratic transition. These are the documents that embody uh, the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people, and that's why uh, we are standing by them. Now, when it comes to uh, this particular term, the, the coup, Sudan has been subject to the military coup restriction uh, in Section 7008 of the Department's Annual Appropriations Act, um, and it has been subject to those restrictions uh, as I mentioned yesterday, since the Bashir regime uh, came to power undemocratically uh, in 1989. Uh, Sudan will be subject, continue to be subject to those restrictions uh, until the secretary determines that a democratically elected government uh, has taken office. And that's what we'll continue to uh, support. Yes? One more. Sure. When sure. do you think the, uh, the U.S. aid is going to be returned to Sudan? I'm sorry, when, did I, when do we the think? The assistance that... Um, um, you mentioned, when do you think it will be returned to them? Well, uh, so to be, to be very clear and to, to go back to, to Matt's question, our humanitarian assistance yes. uh, is ongoing. Uh, and uh, even in countries where we have uh, profound violent disagreements uh, with, the, um, with the government, uh, we continue to support uh, the basic humanitarian needs of a country's people. Uh, what we have uh, paused as we are uh, continuing to uh, assess and to determine our, our next steps um, is the $700 million uh, in uh, bilateral uh, and bilateral assistance. Hey, yes. You know, I should know this, but the problem is that it changes, or the interpretation changes from administration to administration. Is it this administration, is it your understanding that this administration's legal determination is that it can't be a coup, or it isn't a coup, if the government ousted was not an elected one, I, I, or, 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 or can a coup replace? Can it be yeah. a coup if if what happens replaces a government that came to power in a coup? Uh, I am always loath to weigh in on legal questions from the podium, but uh, the shorthand answer, Matt, as I understand it, is that um, according to um, uh, our analysis. Um, the what you uh, the the first iteration of what you said is accurate uh, because the Bashir regime I don't what my first be, because was. because the Bashir regime uh, did not come to power democratically and the and its replacement led by Hamdok was not democratically elected correct so 
a coup determination is moot. That's correct. But, you know, so in Burma, you had a situation where Suu Kyi herself was not elected uh, by anyone. So, although the government had been, the, the state councillor or whatever her title was exactly, she, she was not elected. She was chosen by them, by, by her party. But by a party that was brought to power democratically. <clears throat> so, your, so, so the legal determination is that in that case, even if the figurehead leader is, so in other words, if, 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 if it was just Suu Kyi who had been removed, then I, it wouldn't have been a coup? These are, uh, these sort of uh, ex, ex post facto hypotheticals are, are uh, look. Well, um, I, mean, uh, I, I, I just want to know if you guys have made, if this administration's um, rationale for determining whether something is a coup or not has changed from pre from there from there what history. what I will say is or there was a constant. there was a coup determination that was conducted in the immediate aftermath yeah. uh, of the early February 2021 coup in Burma. Right. Uh, this uh, department uh, determined in short order, uh, given the circumstances, the facts, and the analysis of them on the ground, uh, that what had transpired in Burma was a coup. In the case of Sudan. Um, of course, uh, these are these are apples and oranges. We inherited. Uh, we have a very different situation um, with the military overthrowing uh, a regime that was not democratically uh, put in place. Yes. Uh, there are reports now from Sudan, Sudan that some groups have been in house. I mm. cannot confirm, but but if it is true, how do you comment on that? I, I I haven't seen these reports. It sounds like they're just emerging. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have been calling for the military to release the prime minister. Uh, to release the Minister of Religious Affairs, to release other uh, c members of the civilian government. Uh, I don't want to weigh in until uh, I've seen confirmation of that. Yes. Uh, uh, now, uh, many officials and uh, a lot of people said it is not too late to reverse the cause of events in Sudan. But after yesterday's event, do you foresee an active role for Al-Burhan in a democratic Sudan? And I want to follow up on that. Look, uh, right now, we are focused on uh, helping the Sudanese people achieve a restoration of their democratic aspirations. Uh, that is what we are focused on right now. We can tackle questions uh, of uh, what that might look like, uh, what the implications of this are uh, in the days ahead. Right now, uh, we and our allies and our partners uh, were focused on, uh, as I said before, uh, a few things. Uh, that is an immediate release of all political actors detained in connection uh, with these events, a full restoration of the civilian-led government, uh, ensuring, uh, doing all we can uh, to protect uh, peaceful protesters, ensuring they're not subject uh, to violence, including the use uh, of live uh, fire uh, and ammunition. That is our, uh, that's our focus right Just now. Just to yes. follow sure. up, please, I will, I will follow up on the question asked before. What happened in Sudan took place the minute a U.S. special envoy left the country. And that says something about your influence, the U.S. ability to influence events. Uh, this is not reassuring to your friends. I, what, I, what implication of that on, on the U.S. role and influence around the world? So I, I, I want to be uh, clear on a couple points here. Number one, uh, Ambassador Feltman uh, was in Sudan, had been in Sudan, uh, in, in recent days. Um, we were, of course, uh, not given any uh, pre-notification uh, by the military or others that they plan these anti-democratic actions. Had we, uh, we would have made very clear uh, where the United States would and now does stand uh, in response uh, to any such uh, plans. Uh, but uh, there's something of a chicken and an egg issue here. Uh, Ambassador Feltman uh, was in the region. Uh, he'd been in contact um, over the course of the previous weeks uh, with many in the region, precisely because uh, we had seen indications that uh, Sudan's democratic transition uh, was potentially running into trouble, uh, that uh, there were uh, individuals uh, who might seek to subvert uh, that democratic path. Uh, so these were conversations um, that uh, had been going on uh, for some time. Uh, we had emphasized that the actions to, um, any actions to subvert uh, the democratic transition are unacceptable, would, uh, are a contravention of 
the Constitutional Declaration, uh, which again, along with the uh, Juba Peace Agreement, uh, is the agreed framework for uh, a democratic transition. Yes? Um, on Iran. Anything else on Sudan before we move on? Uh, quickly, sure. in the region and around the world on Sudan. I'm just wondering what direct engagement you've had with the military leadership since the takeover. Obviously, Ambassador Feldman was, was there just before. Uh, so, uh, of course, in the uh, days, weeks, months leading up to this, um, we had engaged with uh, the full range of uh, political society um, in Sudan, including the civilian and the military leadership. Um, uh, since then, we have been focused on discussing, comparing notes, achieving a unified position uh, with our partners and allies uh, in the region, in the broader Middle East, and, and around the world. Uh, I am not aware of any conversations that have taken place uh, with the military leadership uh, since the actions of uh, late Sunday, our time Monday, uh, in Khartoum. Uh, if we feel that it would be constructive, that if it would be useful uh, to help achieve the uh, objective that we and our partners have set out, and that is a restoration uh, of the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people, a restoration of the civilian-led transitional government. If we feel that engagement, direct engagement uh, with uh, a military leader would be useful, uh, we, we, wouldn't, um, we wouldn't shy away from doing that, um, but at this point we haven't done that yet. Uh, yes, uh, Iran, sure. Place. And if so, is this any sort of warning about returning to the talks in Vienna? Uh, what I will say on returning to the talks in Vienna um, is that we've been very clear uh, that uh, the path for diplomacy remains open. Uh, we continue to believe, our partners in the P5 plus one continue to believe that diplomacy constitutes the most effective means to once again ensure that Iran is verifiably and permanently prevented uh, from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, but I don't have any uh, response to, uh, to the first part of your question. Uh, yes, Ben. Yes, uh, thank you, Ned. I have a question on Taiwan and then on North Korea. Uh, the first is regarding the press release today from the Secretary regarding Taiwan's participation in the UN system. I was just wondering about the timing of the release and whether it had anything, whether it coincided with this uh, 50th anniversary of the UN resolution. So uh, yesterday, as I believe, was the 50th anniversary of, of the UN resolution. Uh, but the statement uh, made a broader point. Uh, and the statement made a point uh, that we support uh, to Taiwan's ability to participate meaningfully at the UN uh, and to contribute its valuable expertise uh, to address many of the global challenges we face. Uh, that includes global public health, the environment, climate change, uh, development assistance, technical standards, uh, and economic uh, cooperation as well. Uh, we reiterate, reiterated our commitment to Taiwan's meaningful participation at the World Health Organization and the UN Framework for uh, Convention on Climate Change, uh, and uh, we will continue to support uh, Taiwan's meaningful participation in such forum. But was there a specific reason why you decided to put that out today? Or? why we decided to put it out today. It, it is a, a statement of our support for Taiwan's meaningful participation uh, in these institutions. And, and as you noted, there was an important anniversary. And then so on North- Meaningful in the broader use of your time. Does that mean, and I realize that you want to go back to strategic ambiguity after the president's comments last week, but when you say meaningful, does that mean independent of Beijing? Uh, it means meaningful. It means substantive. Uh, yeah, well, you know what? Means meaningful and substantive doesn't really, it's, that, that, that's kind of useless. It's, to, it, it doesn't mean anything. It, it, what it means, what, well, what, what, what it, what meaningful it, means nothing in this case if you don't explain what it is you mean by meaning. What it, what it means uh, is that Taiwan as uh, a leading democracy. Um, yes, uh, but Taiwan, does that mean, in your view, does that mean that they get, to, that they should be participate in UN fora or other international fora as Taiwan, as Chinese Taipei, or as some kind of adjunct to whatever delegation Beijing sends to these meetings? Uh, what it means is that we believe that Taiwan has uh, important knowledge, expertise, uh, insight, and perspective uh, to lend within these 
uh, institutions uh, in a way that is appropriate and meaningful well, and will continue the uh, to stand that by is, that. The problem is, is that Sorry. no one knows what that means and it just creates more confusion and, and, and makes and makes the, makes makes the situation Matt, worse. We, Do you we, not get that? We we put out an entire statement in the secretary's name on this Sorry. yesterday. I think that a sta that statement Today, was abundantly this morning. This morning, you're right. I was abundantly clear. Uh, sure. I'll yes. Go ahead. Um, there have been some press reports that North Korea would send a delegation to COP26 uh, later this week. Uh, does the State Department plan to have any meetings with any North Korean delegation? Are you open to meeting with them if they're there? I am not aware. Um, uh, first of all, I would have to refer you to Pyongyang to speak to uh, any plans they may have to participate uh, in Glasgow uh, next week. Uh, certainly I'm not aware of uh, any plans that we have uh, uh, at the moment to engage uh, with any delegation from the DPRK. What we have said um, broadly when it comes to uh, the DPRK is that we believe diplomacy uh, is the most effective means by which uh, to achieve what it is that our policy review identified as that overarching goal, and that's a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we are open uh, to diplomacy. Uh, we are ready for diplomacy. We have made clear to the DPRK uh, that we have no hostile intent uh, towards uh, the country, that uh, we are prepared uh, to engage uh, diplomatically with them. We've made that uh, very clear uh, in a series of, of, of messages, uh, and we, uh, we await a response. Yes, Saeed. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to join you too. Uh, but before I do that, I want to add my name uh, in acknowledging Gladys and what she's done over the years, and I want to wish her Godspeed and the best luck in the road ahead. She will definitely be missed. Thank you, Saeed, yes. Yeah. Uh, on the settlement, you know, the Israelis announced on Sunday that they, they, or they, they in fact issued tenders to build 1,300 settlements in seven different uh, settlements and so on. I know in the past you have expressed your, your, your views and you, you told us in this room, you know, an issue that I asked so many times about that your position on the settlement is well known. But what message are you sending the Israelis? Uh, because I think the Israel feels emboldened by your lack of resolve on this issue. By sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question? I said Israel is emboldened by you know they, they they keep doing things. You express you know that you you know you you disagree with the, with this actions and they go on. They are emboldened by your lack of action. Uh, Said, we've had an opportunity to discuss our position on this uh, in this room and in any number uh, of uh, other occasions. Uh, when it comes to what we've heard recently, uh, we are deeply concerned about the Israeli government's plan to advance thousands of settlement units tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, many of them deep in the West Bank. In addition, we're concerned about the publication of tenders on Sunday for 1,300 settlement units, uh, for 1,300 settlement units in a number of West Bank settlements. Uh, we strongly oppose the expansion of settlements, which is completely inconsistent with efforts to lower tensions and to ensure calm, and it damages the prospects for a two-state solution. We have been consistent, as I said, and clear uh, in our statements to this effect. We also view plans for the retroactive legalization of illegal outposts as unacceptable. We continue to raise our views on this issue directly with senior Israeli officials uh, in our private discussions. Yes. Well, I, I, let me just clarify. I have a couple more questions okay. on the Palestine issue, sure. if I may, but I, I wanted to ask you, are you engaging with the Israelis? There is the Secretary of State talking to Mr. Lapid, for instance? Uh, is Michael Ratner, who, Ratner, who was, I think, the charge of affairs, is he talking to anyone? And we are engaging with, with our Israeli partners at right. very senior levels, okay. conveying this message. All right. Now, on, on the issue of the human rights organization. Hold on a second, Mr. Say, sorry, just on settlements. You say that you've been clear and consistent in your, in, your, in, in your view, but you, in fact, haven't. This is the strongest statement that you guys have made about settlements, directly about settlements, since, I think, well, that I've been around, that I've been, that I've heard. Uh, prior to today, you have only said that you oppose any unilateral measures that could, you know, damage the prospects for a two-state solution. And, and, is, and, that, and that statement well, always ended, when you, and, and that includes settlement activity. Including, but you have not said we strongly oppose the expansion of settlements, and, you've, and, and we are, you are, you, you, this is the strongest that you, that, that you have been. Was there a decision, was there a decision made that, the, that, that you had to be, 
that you had to start getting tougher on this? Uh, Matt, our, our messaging on this um, is... Not your public messaging. Our, our public messaging on this is consistent uh, with what we are seeing well, uh, transpire. So fine. It, it, o- it only stands to reason that our, our okay. public messaging may, may shift uh, right. over time. Saeed. Yes, going back to the six uh, human rights organizations. Now, I know that you issued a statement last uh, Friday. I mean, you responded to the issue last Friday. But then you also said that we ought to go, if we have further questions, we ought to go to the Israelis. Is that, is that it? I mean, just is that the end of it? Is that you're just asking journalists and inquirers to, to go back to the Israelis and have them explain? Are you convinced that uh, uh, the Israelis have a reason that these organizations are tied to terrorism? Or in fact, are they telling the truth when they say, and I know Matt asked this question yesterday, that uh, uh, are they telling the truth when they say they shared they shared that information with you? And do you have any plans to meet with these organizations, you know, like the European Union did? So, Saeed, we remain in close touch uh, with our Israeli partners uh, on them, uh, on this. Uh, as you may know, there uh, is an Israeli um, uh, delegation uh, that we'll be uh, meeting with uh, to um, discuss this set of issues. Broadly speaking, uh, we believe that respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, and a strong, independent civil society are critically important to democracy and to responsible and responsive uh, government. And these are uh, conversations that we look forward to having with our Israeli partners. Are yes. you, do you have any plans to meet with any of those six organizations, any American official, whether in the West Bank or anywhere? Uh, I'm not aware of any, uh, of any plans. We don't uh, have any meetings to, to preview. Uh, in Jerusalem uh, at this time. Sure. Do you see any impact on US rela- the U.S. relationship with Israel? Will there be any repercussions if the Israelis go ahead with this despite the, the concerns? The, look, the, these are concerns uh, that we have discussed uh, at very senior levels, at the most senior levels, uh, with our uh, Israeli partners. Uh, our Israeli partners know uh, where we stand uh, and will continue to uh, engage with them uh, in our diplomacy on this. Yes. Canel said, this behavior by the U.S. is not new. Uh, what's your comment on it, and how is it affecting the review of the Cuba policy, policy by the uh, Biden administration? Uh, look, uh, the Cuban people's protests, peaceful protests, on and after July 11th, uh, and with the upcoming uh, plans for November 15th, uh, the Cuban people are voicing their concerns about freedom, about democracy, uh, and the failures of that very regime, the Cuban regime, uh, to meet their own needs, the needs of the Cuban people. Uh, we support, as we have said, the rights of the, of the Cuban people and people everywhere to exercise their freedoms of expression, uh, their uh, ability to assemble peacefully. Uh, we call on the Cuban government to respect these rights and to see this not as an attack, uh, but as an opportunity to listen, to listen to their own people and to do what is right for Cubans and for Cuba. Uh, the Cuban regime is failing to meet the, meet the people's most basic needs. Uh, that includes um, food, that includes medicine. Uh, now is a chance to listen to the Cuban people uh, and to make a positive change. Uh, again, we commend the people of Cuba for peacefully showing the strength of their will uh, and the power of their voice which after uh, the protest of July 11th, the government has consistently attempted to silence, uh, including through violent oppression, uh, including through unjust detentions of hundreds of protesters, uh, including through the detention of journalists, of activists, internet censorship, uh, and other uh, tactics that uh, we reject. We stand with every Cuban seeking a government that respects their human rights and fundamental freedoms. The U.S. is not behind, is not like supporting this kind of protest? Uh, We stand with the right of the Cuban people and the right uh, of people everywhere to assemble peacefully, uh, to have their voices heard. But what we have seen in Cuba since July 11th, what I suspect we will see mid next month in Cuba, uh, is a demonstration uh, not of um, the desires of the United States government. Uh, What we have seen, what we will say, what we will see uh, is a manifestation of the unmet needs, of the unmet aspirations of the Cuban people, 
and the Cuban people's clear attribution of responsibility for those unmet needs and unmet aspirations uh, to the Cuban government. Uh, let me go to the back. Abby. the Biden administration is not prioritizing securing the release of their family members. I wondered if you had a general response and two, they're calling for action. Is there anything within this building that is being done to address their concerns and frustrations? Well, we work tirelessly uh, to secure the release of Americans held hostage and wrongfully detained overseas uh, so that uh, these hostages and wrongful detainees can be safely reunited with their families. Uh, the State Department, our partners across the government, we work closely together uh, on these cases to ensure a focused and coordinated effort that draws on all available government resources and expertise. Uh, the families of Americans who are held captive abroad, uh, we know that they also face incredible hardship as they tirelessly, as they too tirelessly advocate uh, for their loved ones who've been taken away from them. Uh, we remain in regular contact uh, with these families. We are grateful for their partnership. We are grateful for their feedback. Uh, we continue uh, to work to ensure we are communicating and sharing information uh, with them in a way that uh, is useful uh, for uh, these families. As you may recall, Secretary Blinken had an opportunity uh, together um, with Ambassador Carstens, our special envoy for hostage affairs, uh, to meet with the families of Americans held hostage uh, or wrongfully detained abroad. Uh, and he reaffirmed uh, during that session earlier this year uh, that the United States is committed uh, to seeking the release of their loved ones. Uh, Ambassador Karstens leads the diplomatic strategy uh, for the return for the release of Americans held captive abroad. Uh, that uh, includes any number of tactics, including uh, in some cases direct talks. Uh, of course, any negotiations uh, are coordinated uh, throughout the government at very uh, senior levels as well. And of course, our Bureau of Consular Affairs uh, here at the Department of State also provides support uh, to all U.S. citizens uh, de detained abroad. Yes, Sean. Uh, Cuban uh, um, overnight unveiled um, a plan to, uh, to limit, uh, to, to zero out carbon emissions by 2050, but not with any near-term goals. Does the United States have any reaction to this? Australia has been seen as one of the, the holdouts ahead of um, COP26. Well, the point we have made since uh, the very earliest days of this administration, uh, when we uh, rejoined uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, shortly after that, when uh, this administration announced our ambitious uh, climate targets of emissions reductions between 50 and 52 percent uh, in the coming years. Uh, we have made clear that every country around the world, uh, but especially countries, uh, industrialized countries that are major sources of greenhouse gases, uh, have a special responsibility and a special obligation uh, to the current generation, to future generations, uh, to raise our uh, collective climate uh, ambition. Uh, that is what we have done. We've been heartened to see, including in uh, the context of and the aftermath of the um, summit that, uh, on climate that the president pulled together, the White House pulled together in, in recent weeks. Uh, we've been uh, heartened to see um, uh, additional uh, commitments. And of course, uh, we're on a very short runway uh, to COP26 in, in Glasgow, starting, uh, we'll be uh, heading there next week. Uh, and we know for, that the window for limiting uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we know it's narrowing. Uh, we expect countries that have not already done so uh, to arrive in Glasgow with ambitious commitments that bring us closer to uh, that goal. We believe that all countries uh, should collectively commit in Glasgow to, to continue uh, strengthening ambition toward a 1.5 degrees Celsius limit now uh, and throughout this decade. We've made this point before, but this is the decisive decade. Uh, where we think about climate change in terms of years, in terms of decades ahead and its implications. Uh, but now uh, is the moment where that if we miss, uh, the window may well uh, close. Um, so again, many countries have put forward uh, ambitious climate targets. That includes the United States. Uh, we have put forward a bold, ambitious plan, uh, not only uh, because it is the right thing to do for our future, not only because it is the right thing to do for our economy, uh, but also because by demonstrating American leadership, uh, we have the potential uh, to galvanize uh, our allies, partners, and countries around the world as well. 
you, do you think Australia's plan is ambitious enough? You said that this decade is crucial. Uh, this decade is crucial. Uh, look, I'm not going to weigh in from the podium on any country's um, uh, specific um, uh, commitments. Uh, what we know is that uh, what we need to achieve is that collective uh, goal of doing all we can to ensure. Iran um, continues to uh, advance its nuclear program uh, as it has distanced itself uh, from uh, the commitments it made in the JCPOA context. Uh, eventually, uh, the advantages that the JCPOA in, the, uh, in its original form in 2015 and implemented in 2016 uh, will uh, be negated by the advances that uh, Iran will have made uh, in its nuclear program. Uh, so that is why we continue to believe that negotiations, uh, indirect even as they are, uh, need to resume in Vienna. Uh, permanently and verifiably prevented from obtaining a nuclear weapon. But you're not putting an expired date or a set date that they have to return by such and such date? Or I'm, I'm not, not in a position to offer that from the okay. podium. Yes. How long are you going to win? Uh, again, uh, we think that uh, the window is closing. Uh, every day that goes by is another day uh, that Iran is uh, in a position to advance its nuclear program in ways uh, that are concerning. Uh, these are not just concerns on the part of the United States. We have heard similar concerns uh, from our partner, the IAEA. Uh, we've heard similar concerns uh, from our European allies uh, as well. So we're not putting a specific time frame on it, uh, but we are making the point uh, that this is not a process that can go on indefinitely. Uh, the window has been open uh, for months now, but it has also been months uh, since the Iranian government withdrew uh, from the sixth round of talks uh, and has for reasons that you'll have to ask them about, um, uh, they have not been willing to resume a seventh round. Uh, we think uh, the seventh round in Vienna uh, should resume immediately uh, if we are going to make swift progress towards a mutual return to compliance. Just to follow up on Sudan, because everybody now is talking that uh, uh, Prime Minister Hamdouk is out. Do we expect a call between Secretary Blinken and the Prime Minister today if he out. I, again, you're, you're citing reports I, I haven't seen. I wouldn't want to speak to them um, before I'm in a position to confirm them. Uh, the secretary, the special envoy, our assistant secretary, others in this building, others in this administration uh, are prepared to engage, are prepared to communicate um, in ways that we feel has the potential uh, to help advance our goal. Uh, and that is a swift restoration uh, of the civilian-led uh, democratic um, uh, transitional government, uh, a release of political prisoners, uh, seeing to it that uh, those who are peacefully uh, assembling uh, in the streets uh, are not subject uh, to violence. If you weren't able to reach out to him, that means that uh, he's not free, in your opinion. If you weren't able to reach out to him uh, or being in contact with him, uh, how do you define that? Uh, he should be, uh, we have been very clear that should be released from military custody. Thank you. Thank you.